Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the privilege of being here. My name is Michelle, and as Nancy just mentioned, I work with the Data Coordinating Center at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I have the privilege of directing the activities of the registry there. And Dr. Kaminsky and I thought as we began our presentation this afternoon that it would be good to give you an update on enrollment, kind of where we are right now. And so I would like to begin with that before we share a few things that we've learned from the registry. At present, there are 1,194 patients fully enrolled in the patient registry. The, the registration process is both a consent process, because this is research, and it's also a step of completing a user account by which individuals will access their personal survey. So there's sort of a two-step process the initial registration, and then completion of the survey. So 1,194 individuals have completed that entire process. Of those, 597 of you have participated in one or more of the follow-up surveys. They're available twice a year. Those are published in the winter and in the summer. So at least um, 597 have completed one, sometimes more of those. Overall, and you can't see that very well, I'm afraid, but 69% of those who are fully enrolled were able to do so in a single day, which was actually sort of surprising to me. I was sharing earlier, um, there are a number of individuals who are, are pending, and we monitor those in the background. And so it was exciting to me to see such a large number who actually complete the process so quickly. Now, I've actually met an individual here today who logged on this morning, who registered, and is in process right now. So those numbers are going to go up. Um, in the first six months after registration, 91% of individuals are fully enrolled. So I think that's a really great um, testament of that process and how well it's functioning. You see a very tiny portion at the end take a little bit over a year. And I think just reviewing comments that patients provide to us and attendance at some of our local MG meetings, that that's probably attributable to a few things. Um, one, it's a lengthy survey. There's a lot of historic information that we ask you about your condition, and so a lot of times people have to look up uh, medical records and check around for information, and that takes some time. Also, internet access might be intermittent for individuals, and um, as you all well know, MG has um, symptoms that cause you to not feel like doing things from time to time. So some patients take a little bit longer to get through this process, but I share this to show that we have a really healthy registry going on here, and I think things are looking very promising. Toward the end of that enrollment survey, patients have the opportunity to share where they learned about the registry. And like most of us, we get a lot of information from the internet. That's our number one source of information. Your MGFA and other MG chapters follows next with other sources following behind, including doctor's offices and just basic word of mouth. In the last several months, the Data Coordinating Center has been in the process of reviewing the survey and implementing some changes that the MG committee has reviewed and suggested just based on a lot of feedback from persons who have participated, maybe those who didn't complete the enrollment process but who had comments. We review all of those comments. And when you say it's too long, or when you say this question doesn't make sense, we evaluate those things. And the registry committee took quite a bit of time to review all of those comments and to think through how we're asking questions. And this resulted in sort of a revamping of the enrollment survey. We took all of your MG-focused questions, your, your medical history, your quality of life types of things, and moved all of that stuff up to the front, and then followed that with lesser focused things, um, your lifestyle type questions and demographic type questions. We also split the survey into two sections, a Part A and a Part B, to see if maybe that would um, promote and enhance your experience with the survey, make it a little less burdensome. So once you register, at, at least at this point in time, when you register, you'll get access to a Section A, you complete that, submit it online, and then you'll have access to complete the second section of the survey in your own time. 
again, these are things that we're trying to review and to implement to improve and to enhance your experience with the website. Um, we're looking also to add, I don't know if this is the correct word for it, but a, a news board of sorts to the portal of the data entry system such that those who are fully enrolled will have access to monthly updates on registration, on enrollment, some of the feedback that you request about you know, how do other people look in terms of their quality of life measures or how are other people measuring up in this area? And we would like to publish in this sort of setting that information to give back and to let you know that we're hearing you. We're, we're getting your information and it's, it's useful. So we're hope to be, we hope to be um, implementing that within the next several months. I'm working with our programmers to see just exactly how we'll function and how to maintain it. One of the things, the final things that I want to share about enrollment before we move on and Dr. Kaminsky share some of our findings. Um, right now, there is a, well, let me take a step back. In 2010, Congress established what is called the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And as you can imagine, this patient-centered organization has some things to say about patient registries. And one of the things that they say is a standard for registries to enroll at least half a percent. That's not much. That's 0.5 percent of the estimated population for a given condition. So when you look at our current enrollment, 1,194, that's well over half a percent. That's 2 percent of the estimated um, prevalence of MG in the United States. As a point of comparison, the myos, excuse me, the multiple sclerosis registry of their active patients, this 10,847, that represents 3% of the estimated MS population in the United States. We're neck and neck. And we've only been active since our launch in 2013. This registry, the, the MS registry, has been active since 1993. I say this not because we're done. We're not going to stop enrolling at this point. I share this with you just as a an encouragement to say there are really good things happening with this registry and to, to look ahead in anticipation of more good things to come. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kaminsky to share some things. So the only reason I'm interrupting Michelle is I happen to chair the registry committee for the MGFA. And we did a very small rudimentary study early on for the registry asking a very simple question, I think. Um, and that was, why do we have patient registries? Okay, so there are multiple reasons. Many of them are listed here. You heard about the multiple sclerosis registry that started decades ago. That's produced unbelievable information about the patients what kind of problems they have with insurance, what kind of problems they have with urinary tract infections, what kind of problems they have with hospitals, doctors, the cost of care, estimated costs of care. We don't have those things in myasthenia gravis. The physicians have a particular way of looking at things. Nurses have a particular way of looking things. And then there's the patient who's really not represented in the literature in any way. And these registries allow a voice for the patient directly. This is a patient-directed registry. We could have set it up differently going through physicians, but we didn't. We specifically chose the patients to drive this. It tells us how many individuals are out there with myasthenia. It tells us a little bit more about what this disease is all about. I'm going to, in my next section, I'll describe the importance of one of our clinical trials, but we need to know what happens over patients over years and decades. Um, we want to know what your quality of life is. There was a, a wonderful study, I think it was out of, out of Toronto, looking at patients' quality of life when they started with the disease, and then five years later, the physician said, oh, the patient's great. The patient quality of life was the same at each point. We want to know that if that's the truth here. Um, we want to look at variations of how 
the disease is treated. Dr. Sanders has led this outstanding group to find clinical standards of care. Well, from my personal experience, there's a huge variation across the country. We want to be able to measure whether these standards have made a difference. We have a time point now, and we'll have a time point in five years and see if things have improved. If we don't, we know we have to do better. Um, and then that goes also to development of treatments. This registry has the potential to educate everybody here about clinical trials. We're going to hear about how important that is later today and then tomorrow. Pharmaceutical companies develop new drugs. That's the way it is. And that may be in partnership with academics. It may be in, uh, within their own fa fantastic and um, amazingly productive laboratories. But they need some information from you to figure out if they are going to address a certain disease. And if you don't have a registry, and they have no idea what the natural history of the disease and what the need is, they'll go to the next one. Um, and then I think there's potential to look at costs and effectiveness. So the simple study I was referring to a moment ago is we, we just wanted to know, do patients know about their disease? Um, we wanted to know in the registry, do you have acetylcholine receptor antibodies? You know, it's a classic um, diagnostic method. Um, do you have musk antibodies? That's a new subtype, not even new, 16-year-old uh, disease now. It's a new subtype. It's treated differently than acetylcholine receptor antibody positive. Um, did you have an EMG? I think this is probably a no-brainer. It's painful, right? That You remember that. <laughs> the blood test, not so much. I'll get into why I think this is important. Um, right now, we are appreciating that there is not a myasthenia gravis. There's subtypes of this. We know about the acetylcholine receptor antibody. Patients with musk appear to respond differently to, disease, uh, to treatments. There's the early onset and the late onset. As I get older, late onset continues to get old. But we need to define that a little bit better in terms of the characteristics. We want to understand if the, the thymus is different at age 30 versus 65 or 80. Do you need a thymectomy? Do you not? To get at these things, we need information. Um, and the other thing is, I think, kind of underlies this. We want to be able to give information not only to pharmaceutical companies, but to our federal government as to what the impact of myasthenia gravis is on the community. There's been some wonderful studies that Dr. Guptill and Sanders are in the process of uh, estimating costs at an outpatient level. They see what the drivers of the costs are. The world is going that way. We need to try to adjust those costs. We did a small study that we hope to publish soon um, at uh, George Washington where we determine the inpatient costs of myasthenia gravis. And in a nutshell, it's half a billion dollars a year. That's increased 13-fold in the last six years. We want to know what the drivers of that are. And I'll tell you, the driver is not the cost of medication. or It's the, co it's the decision of physicians to bring patients into the hospital. I don't think things have changed that much in terms of patients. So we need to know what those drivers are so we can get ahead of the curve, go to the quarry, put together research grants to improve care in a costly manner, because that's where our society is headed. So these are the things I've kind of uh, already addressed. Now, I think that was kind of interesting, but what Michelle is going to talk about is really interesting. We conducted a small retrospective study of patients fully enrolled in the registry. We, we took a look of a subset of 589 patients who had been enrolled for, or excuse me, had been diagnosed with NG at least three years prior to, to their enrollment. Of those, we took a look at reports, patient report of immunosuppressant therapy usage. And we classified that 589 into two groups. 
We have a group that reported taking at least three immunosuppressive therapies, either in the past or currently, or they reported taking one in addition to some of the more extensive um, therapies that are used for non-responsive MG, such as plasmapheresis and IVIG. So we grouped those into these two groups, your refractory group and a non-refractory group. And you see here how that broke out. 178 of those individuals, is six, not eight, 176 were divided or were grouped into the refractory group with a mean age of 52.3 years. The non-refractory group included 413 individuals, also about 56-ish. And you see their age range here or their gender breakdown. We reviewed the quality of life measures that patients completed as part of their enrollment process. We use the MGQOL15, which includes 15 items that assess basic um, activities um, or their assessment of their engagement in these activities and how, that, how MG impacts their quality of life in these areas. They're ranging from not impacting them at all to impacting them quite a bit. So patients can score up to 60 on this quality of life measure with a higher score, of course, meaning a poorer quality of life or a worsening in that area. We also analyzed the employment status of patients in these two groups. And here are some of the things that we found. Refractory patients experienced significantly higher scores than non-refractory patients in 11 of the 15 items on the quality of life measure. And these things include difficulties with grooming, um, eating, speaking, walking, less ability to enjoy hobbies and fun activities, a good number of things that we all take for granted, I think. Refractory patients reported feeling more frustrated by their MG than did non-refractory patients, though there was not a significant, at least statistical, difference between these groups. And there were no significant differences between them on the impact on their driving or their vision. And there were no significant differences between groups for patients' feelings of being overwhelmed by their MG. And in looking at employment, some of this stuff just seems really obvious. The refractory patients were less likely to be fully employed. They were much more likely to be non-employed. They reported um, significant differences in not being employed because of a disability. And there were differences, of course, in retirement, but that last layer was not a statistical difference between those groups. Non-employed refractory patients were more likely than, this gets to be a tongue twister, than non-employed non-refractory patients to report being retired due to MG. There was not a statistical difference between these groups. And no difference was found between the groups in terms of having to reduce one's work hours as a result of MG. Our conclusion is that having MG that is refractory to conventional therapies does have a significant impact on one's quality of life and on employment. And you might step back and go, well, no kidding, right? You know there's a significant impact in your personal day-to-day -day life because of this condition. But if we take a closer look and see what this type of study has allowed us to do, that is to identify, let me point out individuals and define refractory MG patients, those who are categor categorized based on their patient-reported therapy usage and patient-reported experience with those therapies. We're able to characterize this group. I mean, you saw the table earlier. These are predominantly working age women, right? And finally, we're able to quantify patient-reported outcomes. We've qualified that there is a significant quality of life and employment suffering in this group of MG patients. So what do we do with this information? As Dr. Kaminsky said earlier, we build the foundation of knowledge so that researchers, so that 
federal funding agencies, so that pharmaceutical companies, all those people that have an investment to make in this condition can get involved, and we advocate to them. We present these findings, we share them, we publish them, and we appeal for their help. And this registry, they're just these are just a few things that we can learn from the information that you share, information that could not be gathered by going to all of your doctor's offices and trying to gather up little pieces of information. But you individually can come together online in our online community and provide this personal information and give such a breadth of information that we can quickly build the foundation and the structure that's needed to carry this research forward.